let your game speak louder than your gender. They don't owe you a place. But when you get there, make dang sure that they know your name. This organization wants to empower girls through sports to be their best selves. We started out solely focused on the benefit of physical activity and sport for health. And we wanted to know how we might then connect sport to another outcome. That's when we endeavored to introduce STEM for the very first time. STEM in general is underrepresented, just like many sports in terms of women rep representation. We want to empower these girls to not only you know, play hard and go far in sports, but also in these underrepresented areas of STEM as well. As female athletes, we need to learn. The earlier you learn it, figure it out, the better you will be on the end. Girls my age need to meet women in STEM because that sometimes they might just want to learn stuff about STEM and want to do it too. They might want to do what they're doing. The idea of Play Like a Girl is about confidence, empowerment, but then incorporating the element of play, which I think is probably most important. She got to hear from doctors, she got to hear from women in sports, she got to hear from businesswomen. So having females in these roles now allow girls to say, I could be that person, I could be that coach, I could be that player, and I think it's amazing. One day I'm going to have a family, and now that I do have a family, I have a daughter that looks up to me, and I have to teach her the day you quit is the day that everybody else looks past you. STEM can open many, many opportunities for our girls, and so we focus on providing for them the opportunity to see unlimited possibilities. The truth is that just because somebody else doesn't see the future for you doesn't mean that the future isn't there for you to get. STEM opens the world to girls who many of them have never been outside of their neighborhoods. You don't have to be a professional sport or even play sports in college to gain your self-confidence. I think just playing a sport, doing one of these camps, going to play like a girl programs, all those programs help you learn self-confidence. Studies have shown that girls are two times more likely to drop out of sports at the age of 13 than boys. And we want to we want to shatter that number. We want girls to continue to play sports. Our hope is that as they grow in their confidence, as they learn new skills, as they learn how to, whether they're learning how to code or playing kickball, or that they are growing in confidence, that they are realizing that they can do whatever it is they want to do, they can go as far as they want to go, whether they are the only girl in the room or not. I play like a girl. I play like a girl. I play like a girl. I play like a girl! Even though when you fail, that's just another opportunity to try again. And like, you might feel down because you have not achieved what you was trying to go for. Like, that you can always try again because it's going to help you grow. Since our pilot in July, over 1,500 women volunteers from as far as Silicon Valley and the Big Apple to right here at home in Music City have signed up to mentor and support up to 500 middle school girls ages 10 to 13 through our new virtual mentoring program, Meet and Mentor. What it means to me is to have support of amazing mentors and fellow mentees this program is awesome. We have a whole bunch of mentors from all across the U.S. that actually have joined us. And we talk about really you know, cool things like how to plan for success. And we talk about how to fail as well, which is such an important skill to learn. Play Like a Girl for me was the start of like me coming into being who I am today and getting out of my comfort zone. When I got into the program, I believe I was in the fourth grade and I had a mentor, Sherelle, and we would do everything together. So being in Play Like a Girl gave me the chance to have someone who I looked up to as a big sister. It started at STEM camp and then I became an ambassador. And then like since then, uh, we've been doing a bunch of fun stuff. I went to an Ariana Grande concert with some other ambassadors. We've been doing more virtual STEM camps and activities. I just saw something that I felt like needed to be done and you can do it with anything that you're passionate about. 
everyone to just believe in themselves. I am smart. I am a leader. I am enough. I am beautiful. You are who you create. You are. Like ask someone who you're really close with and, and say, hey, what am I struggling in? What kind of trait am, am I, you know, lacking in? And find ways to you know, build up and, and learn to better yourself in those ways. You girls, all the girls that play like a girl, you girls are needed in the world. You're needed. And one day, you brilliant girl will change the world. We're moving into virtual field trips. So really take this opportunity to ask questions. They're gonna tell you about how cool their jobs are. So we're all set and ready um, to give you guys all kind of a virtual experience of what their jobs are. I really like speed mentoring when we get to talk with all the different mentors. The thing that I liked the most was talking to our mentors and sharing our issues. So do not let your negative self talk. Talk you out of your passion and what you love to do. Don't miss out on that. I'm Kayla Kirk and I'm a project engineer with Turner Construction. I would say my advice to girls would be there's nothing you can't do. No, the worst they can ever say is no, so always ask the question. I'm Michaela Costin. I'm the project manager for the Mid-State MOB project here in Nashville, Tennessee with Turner Construction. I'm very passionate about bringing more females into this industry. We bring so much to this field with our diversity of thought, emotional intelligence, and multitasking skills that this is a very rewarding career for any female. If you love building things with your hands, if you love having a tangible project to show off at the end of the day, construction is a great career for you. I think I'm gonna be, I think I'm gonna be. La, 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 la. So my name is Herbert Brown. I'm the Community and Citizenship Director for Turner Construction here in Nashville, Tennessee. It's just very critical for males to advocate for young women. And it's really just a matter of just dreaming, working hard, being patient, and not really putting any limitations to what she can do. My name is Miranda McDonald, and I am the Director of Community Development for Calvert Street Group. I am proud to be a monthly donor uh, to Play Like a Girl because it is important to support girls while they're young and, and not water down their dreams. We have an opportunity to feed that flame, uh, to encourage and endorse that strong brilliance that they need to have, then I think that Play Like a Girl is certainly a vehicle to make that happen. Greetings. Welcome everyone here um, in Washington DC at the National Archives Museum and online. My name is Alice Camps. I'm a, the curator of All American, The Power of Sports, our special exhibition in the Lawrence F. O'Brien Gallery. I am delighted to be here to help open tonight's program, Girl Power, Inspiring the Next Generation of Women Athletes. Our panelists will talk about experiences and inspiration in the world of women's sports, a world that has changed drastically in the last 50 years. This revolution is due in no small part to Title IX, part of the Education Amendments Act of 1972, which prohibits sex-based discrimination in federally funded ex uh, education programs. This landmark legislation resulted in more women in sports and more opportunities to, for women to compete at the college and professional level. You can see Title IX, along with other fascinating sports records in All-American. It's on display here through January 7th, 2024, and it's full of fascinating act artifacts that explore the government's use of sports to define and promote national identity, unite citizens, and teach American values. 
It also presents records related to historic athletes like Billie Jean King and Wilma Rudolph, who challenged the United States to live up to its stated goals. I invite you to visit either in person here at the museum or online at museum.archives.gov slash all hyphen American. It's now my pleasure to introduce our partner in tonight's program, Dr. Kim, Dr. Kimberly Clay, CEO of Play It Like a Girl, a national nonprofit organization that leverages skills girls gain from sports to help prepare them for competitive male-dominated careers in science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. And thank you all for being here. Welcome. Uh, tonight is going to be an exciting opportunity for us to share with you what we do with and for girls all across the United States of America through Play Like a Girl. I am so thankful for the partnership and opportunity to represent Play Like a Girl as a member of the Honorary Host Committee for All American the Power of Sport exhibit here at the National Archives. I am equally uh, proud to also bring programming uh, to our nation's capital, to girls across the country, to girls across the world, uh, because tonight we are live streaming to a global community. It is my pleasure, uh, my honor, to team up with uh, the the National Archives, the museum, as well as the foundation, and specifically to partner with them in advancing the mission of Play Like a Girl to inspire the next generation of women athletes. Girl Power, that's the name of tonight's event. Girl Power is an extension of our mission to level the playing field for girls everywhere. To accomplish this, we harness the collective power of women volunteers and male allies to unite around their ability to actually make a difference in the gender inequity issue and problem that we face in our country and around the world. We specifically work, as mentioned before, to leverage the skills that girls gain from sport participation to help propel them into competitive male-dominated careers in the STEM fields. Why? Because we are committed to helping every girl, including you in the audience, both here in the room as well as out in the world of the internet, to help you actually reach your full potential. That's our goal. So thank you for joining us uh, both online from all over the world tonight and for those joining us here in the theater in Washington, D.C. For those online, we'd love for you in the chat or comment uh, box to share with us where you're joining us from. I think it'd be interesting to see where uh, folks are represented. And everyone, including those in the theater, be sure to share the YouTube link to share it on your social pages, encourage your audience, if not watching it live tonight, to also go back and watch it later. It will be there for you to share. But don't stop there. Let's keep the conversation going online. Please share your screenshots, your photos, your videos, and you'll get to take a lot of them with the athletes themselves tonight. Tag at I play like a girl and include the hashtag ready for any field because that's what we are doing. We are preparing girls all over the world to be ready for any field. And when you tag at I play like a girl and hashtag ready for any field, we will be able to reshare your message and continue to amplify the message from tonight. I'm especially excited because tonight you get to hear from some remarkable Play Like a Girl ambassadors, women who represent the spectrum of sport, women who represent sport on and off the field. Those women, those elite women athletes will share their inspiring stories and they will give some sage advice with us and to us tonight. But before they come, 
there's one very special young woman who actually is a member of our Play Like a Girl program community in Nashville, which is where we call home. She traveled today, first time ever to the nation's capital, all the way from Nashville at an early, early hour at about six o'clock this morning to explore Capitol Hill and to share tonight with us and our athletes. Zebo, I'd love for you to stand so that we can recognize you. Congratulations. Thank you. Zebo is one of our middle school students from Nashville. She literally just completed a six week uh, leadership academy where she was learning about the M in STEM, mathematics, but not just the math. We also taught our girls about money because it's especially important that we begin to actually make a difference towards financial literacy and economic freedom for young women in this country. And so that is part of the work that we've been doing with our partners, US Bank and Juniper Square. And so it was a great opportunity for Zebo and several of the other girls in Nashville to be mentored and taught and learn about how to manage money, how to plan for their future, and how to actually outline some goals around college and career, and how to go about financing it without student loans. That's our goal for our girls. This was, again, Zebo's first visit to the nation's capital. So she spent her day exploring culture, history, government, and the women's movement, among so many other things. So I know that she is going to have lots of stories to share tomorrow back in our classroom at Strive Collegiate Academy, one of our partner schools in Nashville. So shout out to Strive and all the students at Strive who are watching and to Principal Butler for your ongoing partnership with Play Like a Girl and for excusing Zebo from school today. So thank you and congratulations again, Zebo. To learn more about Play Like a Girl or to bring Play Like a Girl to your community, visit our website at iplaylikeagirl.org. We also offer virtual mentoring. A huge part of what we've done uh, post-pandemic is to really extend our programming such that girls all across our country can benefit from the wonderful opportunities that our partners like the NFL and LPGA and so many others are affording girls in Nashville. We want to provide those same opportunities to girls elsewhere. And so again, we leverage the collective power of our women volunteers and male allies all across the country in corporate and non-corporate positions on the side of sport within sports agencies and organizations, those who represent uh, athletes, those who are athletes themselves current and former, we have tons of partnerships and opportunities for you to actually engage and get involved with the girls directly. And if you'd like to mentor, visit our site at iplaylikeagirl.org slash mentor. And while you're there, be sure to join our email list so that you can actually stay updated on all of the late breaking happenings with Play Like a Girl. Super exciting things, just like what you will experience tonight. We do them every single week of every single year. And so with that, I will now introduce our host, our moderator, and yes, another athlete. Natalie Calabot is a sports anchor, broadcaster, and host who is currently doing live sports broadcast as a play-by-play -play announcer, color analyst, and reporter for ESPN and several other sports networks. She too is an athlete. Her sport, championship diving at the collegiate level. Tonight, we count Natalie as a Play Like a Girl ambassador. She's going to guide the conversation from the stage, but she'll also lend her voice to the Play Like a Girl rally cry as well. So if you would, help me to welcome Natalie, and Natalie will bring out your special guest for tonight. Please engage with us online, share the YouTube clip, and again, share and tag I Play Like a Girl, ready for any field, anywhere that you find us on social media. Enjoy.
Dr. Kimberly Clay for that wonderful introduction. I'm Natalie, a former diver turned TV broadcaster. So it feels so incredible to be here with you all. Thank you so much for having us. We're gonna cover the topic, girl power, inspiring the next generation of women athletes. And I know for myself and my athletic career, I would not be here today if it wasn't for the sport of diving. And I know that the power of sports can bring women together and it can also provide a platform for us to be as successful as possible. So with that, I'd like to thank you all for having me here today and I'd like to bring out our star studded panel. A, trailbla a trailblazer in professional softball signing the first million dollar contract for the scrapyard dogs of the National Pro Fast Pitch League a two-time Olympic silver medalist and now an author of her very own book, Rise and Shine, The Monica Abbott Story. Let's uh, please give a warm welcome to Monica Abbott. She has a BA in public policy from Stanford University, where she also played basketball, and an MBA from the Wharton School at the University of Pennsylvania. Following her career with the New York Liberty in the WNBA, she spent some time as the NBA's Associate Vice President of Basketball Operations and is now the Head of League Operations for the WNBA. Please welcome Bethany Donovan. She has a degree in um, uh, medical mechanical engineering from Dartmouth College and is a U.S. Alpine ski racer and two-time Olympian currently competing on the FIS Audi World Cup speed circuit. Growing up in Buffalo, New York with five siblings, she had an alternative path to success to the U.S. ski team that she will share with us later on in this program. Please welcome Patricia Trisha Mangan. All right, so before we start, I would like everyone during the program to just jot down some questions. We're gonna do a Q&A at the end. So if you have any questions for any of us up here, we'd love to answer them. So thank you all for being here to join our conversation. Again, the topic is girl power, inspiring the next generation of women athletes. So ladies, let's first start with, what does it mean to be a woman in sports today? Okay, I'll start. Um, what does it mean to be a woman in sports today? I think it, we are at the best state ever right now for, to be a woman in any sport. The amount of growth that we've had because, because of TV, but most importantly, because of the social media impact that we're able to have, it's created awareness, right? It's created conversation. And it's created these cool highlights. How many of you see, have seen like a 12 year old doing something amazing on social media, right? Um, and you can see them at 12 years old and you can see them at the pro level. So seeing that awareness, seeing it first makes you believe and creates a dream inside of you that you can do it first. Sometimes as women, we need role models and people to see it first and that visibility and awareness via TV and social media is allowing our young athletes an even more powerful experience to be, to be the future. Yeah. yeah, I agree. I think we're at a zenith for women's sports. You know, I, I, one of the things that is, the talent and, and like the quality of play has been there, right? There, I, I, I do think that, I mean, just speaking for basketball mm -hmm. specifically, the talent, I'm glad I played when I played because mm -hmm. I don't know about uh, getting out there on the court with, with these players now because the, the, the talent's phenomenal. Um, but I do think that it's, it's the visibility. When you look at um, the, the women's national championship game for basketball at the college level, 9.9 uh, .9 million viewers because that game was broadcast on ABC. And you, you think about the... <laughs> yeah. And, and the talent was ready to be displayed. So I think that it's, it's an awesome time to be in women's sports, no matter what the sport is. And I, I also am heartened by the fact that it is a kind of a rising tide lifts all boats. I think there's so much um, kind of shared vision around what can happen across all women's sports. And 
um, certainly it starts with girls wanting to play sports, so I'm really excited to be part of this event today, but what an awesome time to be, to be part of this entire ecosystem. Yes, I totally agree with what Monica and Bethany said. Um, the, the talent and being able to see it to believe it, I think is so important. And I think also I feel very lucky that I came at a time post Title IX because I think that another aspect of um, girls in sport is, is increasing the opportunity for girls to be out there and they seeing more role models, they're seeing all this inspirational in women in sport already and there's amazing foundations like I Play Like a Girl that are working to create more opportunity and so I'm really excited um, to be here and I am also very hopeful that we can continue the wave um, and continue to increase uh, girls' participation in sport um, and that the trajectory will just keep on going up. I want you ladies to take us through how you started in your sport, how you started in skiing, how you started in basketball, how you started in softball, and what is something that you wish you knew when you first started? Um, well, I started playing softball because, well, I had an older sister that wanted to play and it was easier for my parents to put <laughs> us both on the same team <laughs> um, and easier to drive us to practice that way. Uh, it started that it started that way. I was fortunate enough that my mom had played in a in a rec league in a rec softball league, and and we played in that same league or a subsidiary of it, and that's how that's kind of how we started. It started as a family event. Let's get them active. Let's get them on a team sport to kind of be outside and learn in a positive in a positive environment, and then it just kind of took off. Um, if there was one thing that I wish I had seen is kind of goes back to what I said originally is that visibility, um, the more information, the knowledge. When I was young, softball wasn't on TV. You know, women's sports wasn't really on TV. I remember the first other tall woman I saw in my area that was over six foot um, was my height. It was in high school, was my high school athletic director. Um, and she had played college basketball on a five on three uh, court, if you know what that means. Uh, so yeah. I just remember that that's when only three people can cross the half court line. Um, so, and I remember seeing her and being like, wow, like, I wish I had seen more people like that. I wish I had been able to read, I wish I would have been able to read about them. I wish I would have been able to watch them on TV or view them in other places. The people that I looked up to were like an age o older than me because that's all that I was, that's all that was visible to me. Yeah, well, I, I, there was definitely a height thing. It's like, well, you know, you're, I, 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 I think I started playing when I was about 12 and I was probably 5'11 mm -hmm. and, you know, <laughs> it's time to do something, you know, with that height, I guess. But, um, I, you know, it was really just, an, it was something that, it was a genuine curiosity. Like, it was something that I just thought was worth giving a try to. Um, I will say that, like, my family is very rooted in kind of education and the arts, and so my mom was not super excited about me playing sports. So it was kind of my first act of rebellion, to be honest, because I, I fell in love with it. You know, I was 13 going to Pat Summit basketball camp at the University of Tennessee when I was spending the summers down there with my family, and I saw what was possible. It was the first time that it felt pretty normal to be as tall as I was, and it felt okay to be strong and to use my body to achieve my goals. And like, that was something that, um, you know, I learned uh, kind of because I pursued something boldly that, you know, I didn't necessarily have uh, the support for. Ultimately, she very much came around and she was, she was at all of my games and going to all of the tournaments, but um, yeah, my, with my mom, but it, it was something that I just, there was a fire lit inside and started with just curiosity and then realizing there's so many things available to me if I just stick with this. Yeah, I think um, my journey in sports was uh, similar as well to both of yours. It was um, kind of, actually I was exposed to a lot of different sports as a little girl and tried them all and um, I was very lucky because I had lots of siblings to do them with, but I think that uh, a big aspect for me with ski racing in particular was that um, it was such a fun social 
event and I think sports uh, for kids, that's, that's a lot of what draws us into them. And then um, I think the reason I um, went more towards skiing versus the other sport is that it was definitely an opportunity for me to um, work really hard at something and kind of let my inner competitiveness shine. And um, in sport, that's, that's rewarded. And I really loved the process of working hard at a goal and um, just giving that goal your all and then seeing what happened. Um, I'd say looking back, if I could tell my younger self um, a lesson, I would maybe tell myself to be a little bit less stubborn and ask people <laughs> for help. Because that, that was a lesson that took me a while to learn and I think is one of the most important ones I've learned from sport. Obviously, these three women are sitting up here next to me, then, and you both, you all of you have achieved such an incredible, um, just incredible accomplishments throughout your entire athletic and professional careers. And obviously, it wasn't easy. There were obstacles, maybe some failures. Can you talk about maybe a, a breaking point or um, maybe a failure or, or a, a, a tough point in your career and what you learned from it? For me, oh, some of the one of the moments that always sticks out for me is the college years for me because there was a lot of just pivotal moments where your back was up against the wall. But for me, I resisted. I, re I resisted change. Um, I was scared of it. I was scared to change and grow. I was like, okay, I was super. I was successful in high school. I was successful doing what I had always done. Always done. Like, why would why would I change something? Why wouldn't I just keep doing the same thing? And, I th and um, it hurt me in my development and my growth as, as a person, especially, but it's, and, and it also hurt me as an athlete because I wasn't willing to reevaluate re things. And that was a hard lesson for me to learn in college. We lost a lot of games because of that, because of my, my own personal unwillingness to change. If I had changed early, I, earlier, I could have grown um, and evolved faster, right? I could have thought about things quicker and learned, learned it faster, right? Um, it's hard to change sometimes, and it's scary, especially when things that get you to a certain, a certain level, like the collegiate, you know, collegiate level. I played at Tennessee. Hey, Pat Summit, you're the best. Um, <laughs> at, I bet I played softball there, and, um, you know, I had, I had to change to be able to get, reach the goals that I wanted. I had to change to be able to, to think about myself as an athlete in a different way. And I had to change to bring, to bring other people with me, um, to bring a community with me. And it took me a while to realize that. Um, but once I did, obviously, you know, the world opened up to me. It's hard, failure is such a, tricky word because mm -hmm. you like you learn so much when you fail mm -hmm. and and there's so much victory in what you learn that in some ways you can't get any other way um, I'd say kind of one of the one of the moments that stands out that didn't go the way I hoped it would go um, was when I was kind of done with my college career um, I didn't get drafted into the WNBA um, but I had um, I ended up kind of working out with a coach who was friends with the general manager of the New York Liberty. And I grew up in New York City and I was a huge Liberty fan. And it was just the serendipitous kind of connection where I'd been like putting in the effort to improve as a player. And she told her friend who happened to be the general manager of the New York Liberty. So I'm like, oh my gosh, my destiny is just aligning. This is so perfect. I didn't get drafted, but now I can go play for my home team in the WNBA. And I got cut. I, I went and I played in training camp. I played the best I ever played and I got cut. And I was like, that can't be right. Like, that, this is my dream. I'm supposed to, this, everything aligned perfectly. And then what do you do in that moment when you have to kind of pick yourself back up and understand like what the path forward is if this is where you actually wanna be? Um, and so I went overseas and I, and I played in Europe and worked on it. And I just, you, you kind of, you, you take the feedback and you, if you can actually absorb it and not resist it and then actually use it to like craft your path forward, it really can be 
such an incredible benefit, if, especially, you know, and it's not that often, sports is wonderful in that way in that it gives you real feedback and, mm -hmm. and it allows you to, to use that feedback. Um, and so I'd say like that was an important moment for me to, because it showed me how much I wanted something and then, and then it was up to me to decide kind of what was I actually going to do to go and get it. And it did work out. I did end up playing for the New York Liberty. Um, so it has a nice ending, but it was, it was you know, not the pathway that I thought it would be. It was not a direct path. Yeah, um, this is such a great question because I think that it's easy to look at any one of us and you hear about what um, these amazing women have accomplished and you hear all the, you know, all the highlights and you don't often see the failures or hear about the time that I lost this race or I was cut. Um, but I think that just like Bethany said, those are the opportunities that you can learn the most from. And um, that has certainly been true in my career. I think all of my biggest inflection points have come from times when I've had my biggest defeats. And um, it certainly doesn't feel good in the moment. Um, I'm not someone who enjoys losing, but I think that it's really important to know that it's okay, everyone does it. Um, most people lose a lot, especially if you're in an individual sport, there's only gonna be one winner. Um, but to kind of let yourself feel that disappointment and then similar to what Bethany said, um, use it as feedback and just take a step back and think about, okay, what is my plan? Um, and try to learn from it as much as possible. Um, one story from, from my career in particular is I went to, when I was still very young, I, I often um, cite this as the biggest inflection point in my career. I went to U16 nationals and I came from a super small mountain. I didn't even know it was a race, but I went to the other side of the country and I think I came last in almost every single event, <laughs> um, which, which was definitely hard to swallow, but I used that um, feeling for the rest of the next season and just used that as motivation um, to really give ski racing my all, and I just wanted to go back and not lose. <laughs> but I ended up going back the next year and doing right very well and um, finishing, I think, fourth overall, and that was when I made the national team. So I think it's just another example of using setbacks, not as failures, but as opportunities to learn and grow and become a better athlete and person. So keep pushing. Yes, for sure. Just keep pushing, don't let anything get you down. Um, Bethany, I love that you mentioned that connection with New York and uh, the Liberty were always on your mind, um, kind of that goal and the importance of you know, bulldozing that door down, not allowing no to be an answer. How important is networking? So even past your playing career, how much does sports, how does it open the door for possibilities professionally for all of you women right now? Yeah, I mean, sports certainly, you know, now that I'm on the side and when I'm in a leadership role for the WNBA, like sports is a relationship business. And it makes sense that it is, you know, when you think about kind of the fact that you have teammates, like there's, you're building relationships the entire time that you're growing as an athlete. So um, yeah, it's, it is a relationship business. And you know, the role that I have now, um, I got, I actually started at the NBA, um, working on the NBA side, uh, because a former teammate of mine from Stanford was like, hey, you know, they're looking for somebody that has, you know, with a background that might be kind of similar to yours. Are you, would you maybe want to take a look at this role? And I wasn't even thinking about it. I was, I was working, I'd gone away from sports. I was working at Deloitte doing strategy consulting. Like, wasn't thinking about the game necessarily. I always had, I thought somewhere down the line I might want to work in sports, but, you know, didn't have a defined timeline for that. And a former teammate called me. And it's like, those are the connections. You just never know kind of when something that you've done, some, some connection that you made um, will, will come back to you in a way that is really positive. And that's why it is so important to be building kind of genuine, authentic relationships, no matter what it is that you're doing. You just never know. Like, if you can, if, if I have a, it's funny, like a coffee mug that I always have on my Zoom calls. Um, but it just says, work hard and be kind to people. And it's just, it really is this like very simple philosophy that can guide your relationship building because it, it, when people think of you that way and they know that you're going to put the effort in, they, they know that no matter what it is you're doing, whether it's on the court, field, 
boardroom, you're going to put your entire all into it. I think it, it really helps, you know, it, it helps people, ha it helps your, your brand when you think about how you are able to move through the various spaces within any industry, but particularly within sports. Yeah, I would say kind of kind of like definitely teammates, people you played with, coaches and everything. But just because I just wrote this and this question just sparked it, but I wrote this book, Rise and Shine, and it's actually kind of funny. The authors of this book were actually, um, they were, I wouldn't call, they were fans, they were Tennessee softball fans when I was there. And they became big fans of mine. Their daughter was the same age as me and was in a couple of classes at school with me. And then they would come to the games when I was in college. And then after, you know, 10, 20 years later, <coughs> however <coughs> many years you want to say, after the Tokyo Olympic Games, you know, they reached out to me and they're like, hey, like, they called or text and was like, hey, we watched the games. We loved seeing you play, all of this stuff. And they said, you know, if you ever want to write your book, we love your story. We followed you this whole time. Like, please, please consider us to be your authors. At that time, I had like, you know, maybe one day I'll write a book. Maybe I'll think about doing it. Um, and I, when they reached out to me, I was like, oh my gosh, like this makes sense. Here, I'm going across the country all the time, speaking to youth, speaking to colleges, speaking to pros about how to make a difference with your career, how to, how to grow and change and evolve and all these things. Maybe it's time I put it on paper, but the network that I had and the one off of my network, right? Like a, a classmate whose parents became good friends. They came to softball games socially. I got to know them really well, reached back out, you know, many years later and offered to write um, the, this book for me. And, that's literally why I, ha I did it, <laughs> literally why I have it today. So pretty cool story um, and being able to create something. Yeah. yeah, and I think my network maybe looks a little bit different as I'm still competing, but I um, think that network and an extension of that, at least for me, is the community um, that uh, I've been able to find through ski racing has been so important to me. Um, I, as a little background, was on the national team and then I was off the national team for a couple of years. And during that time, um, I really had to lean into my community and um, be humble enough to ask for help and reach out to all these people. Um, and I always say that was the biggest silver lining of um, having to race as an independent athlete because I'm not sure if I would have found that community in the same way if I didn't. And um, that really opened me up to just how many people are out there um, and wanting to support you and love what you do and are inspired or motivated by it or um, just love your sport. And I think that oftentimes it maybe is hard when you're super focused on your sport um, and you're competing overseas um, or you're doing individual sport to really see the broader community. But I just think that that is so special and something every athlete should lean into because um, as <laughs> you can see, it, it definitely pays off down the road, but more than anything, it makes you feel like you're doing something bigger than just yourself. Um, and it also, in, in my experience, has um, created a really positive um, a team behind me and has definitely led to so much of my success, which I think it's just uh, very special to be able to share what you do with as many people as possible. And um, sport is definitely an amazing avenue for that. And I've met my closest friends, um, my biggest supporters, so many role models uh, through sport. So I think that community is just the most important thing. And we are a community. Yes. Women in sports, we yeah. are our own network and young girls watching can lean on women like us who are, well, I'm retired, you're not retired, you are, <laughs> Monica just retired, can lean on us for advice and, and uh, networking opportunities. But how can young women and girls continue to break barriers in their sports? Yeah, that's, that's a really good question. I think kind of 
what you're saying is that you should lean on your community and take the opportun any opportunity you have to, be, to connect with um, women and girls that are maybe one level ahead of you or have done a similar experience because mm -hmm. at least in, um, in my experience, I think that I resisted that for a little bit because I was just very independent or thought that my route was maybe different than others, but there are so many people out there that even if their experience isn't the exact same as yours, do, they do have very, very valuable input and advice. And I think just um, if you're a young girl and, and you do want to break boundaries, um, you should ask for help. And there are so many people out there that are willing and want to and excited to help you. And I think that's how you do it. Yeah, I think that point's really a good one because the, the community that is standing ready to support young girls, I think there's, there's, there's a lot to be said about tapping into that community. I certainly, when I was first starting, especially since I was kind of being a little bit of a rebel, as I said, like I was, I was very dependent on kind of the, the teammates and the coaches and um, you know, to, to see something past what was directly in front of me because I didn't have necessarily like an example of a you know, professional women's basketball player to model myself after. So I do think that leaning into that and, and finding people, and it's so much easier now because you have social media as a, as a tool and it can be used effectively to connect people. And so like, there are so many different communities. This one is, is an important one. Um, and, and I think the, the ability to find, your, like, find the people that you can see yourself in, both who are going or at the same stage of, of your journey, but also to your point, a, a couple steps ahead um, can really be helpful when you're trying to do something bold or something you've never seen done before. Yeah, I think this one like kind of holds close to my heart because I feel like we see a lot of barriers being broken these days, but we still kind of have a ways to go, right? Especially us female athletes, our, in our women's sports. Um, the biggest thing I would say, not only for, mostly probably to the parents watching or to the supporters watching is, you know, I, one is like, ask, like if you don't, if there's something that your sport needs or your organization needs, ask, ask. And if it's not there, go create it. Like, mm -hmm. go create it. People are there to support you. And then for everyone else that's supporting or, or a fan or an athlete, think about how you can go and reinvest. So ask, ask your staff, ask your people like, hey, why don't we have a ice bath? Why don't we have a sauna? Why don't we have this? You know, if it's not there, find a way to create it. Find a way to make it happen. <laughs> and lastly, for everyone else, like reinvest, reinvest your time, your resources, your money back into those sports and organizations that are driving it forward because that's we women's sports like when you think about the title IX document the 70s right but how long i mean how long has baseball been around right like how long has men's sports been around like generations like that's general generational sports like generations they and they keep coming back over and over, parents and grandparents and great-grandparents and their sons and their sons and their sons and their families, right? So for women's sports, it's really important that as the next generation gets born, the next generation plays and becomes CEOs and Olympians and broadcasters that we continue to ask, we continue to create the change and we continue to reinvest into our sports world. Speaking of that Title IX document, it's in this building. We got to see it before we came up here. What does seeing that mean to you all, to all of you individually? <laughs> yeah, I think uh, it was very special to see it um, and read it. And it was a lot more formal than I um, anticipated, which I think that it's, it's really good for us to see that document and see that was so formal because that was a huge deal because that was a huge change that needed to be made. And we're now 51 years past that. And um, there are still, as Monica said, changes that need to be made. But I think that it's just a good reminder of um, that was change in a time that 
it seemed impossible that um, like it was just such a big step and to see that and to know that we can continue taking those big steps towards equality in women's sports. And so yeah, I think it's, it's really motivational and I definitely encourage everyone to check out the museum yeah. exhibit. When I see that document, like the first word that pops into my head is opportunity. Just like it gives me chills and almost makes me wanna like tear up a little bit. Mm -hmm. But when I see it, I see opportunity. It changed the entire landscape for women. And I think there's a lot of people in this room or watching that can agree with me. There's a lot of people that have directly impacted my life that would say the same thing. Mm -hmm. And I know for the fact it created opportunities that probably half of us can't even imagine. Mm -hmm. Opportunity in one piece of paper, it, like ch it changed, it changed everything. Often I think, especially we, there's been so many conversations about the 50th anniversary of Title IX and, and we end up talking a lot about where is, where is women's sports now because of 50 years of Title IX. But I actually think it's so much broader than that. When it's like, it, it's not even, when you think about the participation numbers and how many women have played sports, you know, I, I've worked across different industries and now, you know, part of our leadership team at the WNBA our, the commissioner of the WNBA played college basketball, mm -hmm. right? So like there's so many, and she was the CEO, first female CEO of Deloitte, right? So it's not, she, it, it's not what she was never a professional basketball player. It's what sports afforded her that she then went and did, the way she impacted and changed her community. That's, and that's true for so many different women. And you know, there's all the percentages around kind of how many women in C-suite roles played sports at some point. And it's, that's what Title IX did too. Like it's not just where, and I, we do have a lot, of, a lot more ground to cover. Um, you know, I'd, I'd love in 50 years and the, the 100th anniversary of Title IX for us to be having a very different conversation about equity and, and about where women's sports is relative to, to, to their men counterparts. But it's, it's remarkable how sports can change lives, even if all you do is, is you know, pick it up for a little while and then go on and do something different and, and pursue your next passion. Yeah, the opportunities are endless for women in sports, that's for sure. Still so much more growth to be had as well. I think it's that time to open it up for questions in the audience. Sure, thank you. So thank you very much. Uh, my name is Cornelia Weiss. I'm a former athlete as well. Um, um, and I come from the freestyle skiing world. So it's great to see a skier up there. Um, so part of uh, opportunity also means financial opportunity because without money, you can't compete. You can't do anything. Um, and, and this is perhaps uh, a question that's not answerable, but um, I'll direct it to the, the media uh, presence here. Um, because right now it's my understanding that uh, there still are several contracts not signed for the uh, women's uh, uh, soccer games that are coming up um, because uh, you have uh, these news, uh, these television stations in uh, Europe not willing to pay um, more than just absolutely peanuts um, and the numbers don't reflect that. So uh, if you all could address money, because money is a big opportunity and it's also a big barrier and it just, you know, and you all couldn't have competed except for having the financial wherewithal to do that. Thank you. Uh, I'll start. Um, yeah, money. Right, that's a big, that's a big topic. Um, where do I start on this? Okay, <laughs> I, um, first off, I would say one of the great things about the visibility is I think for, I think for a long time, and this might be, I think I'm gonna tread lightly here. I think for a long time, we didn't, women's sports didn't have the numbers or the background data or information to support some of the bids and asks they were asking for at the major uh, business levels, sponsorships, TV, all that stuff. But with, the sp with women's sports getting more visibility, with 
with women's sports creating stars, right? Like Instagram personalities, social media stars, numbers that are huge, right? On TV, uh, the, you mentioned the college basketball finals, the women's college softball finals are incredible. With these numbers, now we have background data. So, so now it's kind of like, okay, here, here are the facts. Now it's not just talk. Now here are the actual written down facts to be able to support it. So I think that's been a, a big step. Um, obviously money's always a challenge and yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, the media rights fees, is, that's always the conversation when it comes to, to women's sports. Um, you know, the, and I, I agree that there was a time when, you know, the, the viewership numbers and the, we're thinking about the eyeballs on the game, like they weren't necessarily there, but we're starting to see, and it's not been that long that we're seeing these kind of, you know, viewership numbers start to change the way that they have. And I think there has to be a reevaluation of can, what, what do you get when you're consuming women's sports? And I, before I, you know, I think there's certainly a time when it was an altruistic endeavor, or it's you do it because it's the right thing to do, or you know you want to be supportive of women. Um, I think there's a piece of that that's still in there, but there's so much to be said about the actual quality of play that has changed. I think there's a, there's a there has been a sea change when it comes to um, you know actually like there are there's there's an audience now, and there there are viewership numbers that support that. When I think about the WNBA. What we, what we do in, in terms of linear viewership, what we do in terms of social consumption, you know, we're certainly on par with um, you know, some professional men's leagues. So our, do our media rights fees reflect that yet? No, but I do think that it is coming and that's the next, I think, frontier for, for women's sports and when it comes to um, financials specifically related to, to media rights. Yeah. Um. I agree that it's also uh, going back to um, what we talked about with uh, male sports being generational and Title IX just being 50 years ago. I think that um, the shift to equality will take some time, um, and I think we are seeing uh, positive trending in that direction. I know I feel super lucky to come from a sport that the two most um, successful ski racers are both women, um, Michaela Schifrin and Lindsey Vaughn, um, or two of the most in the US, and, and Michaela just is now the most winningest in the world, men and women. So I think that that is a huge testament to the progress we're making, and I mean, her motto is always be faster than the boys, so like, what's cooler than that? <laughs> but um, it will take some time, and. I think that that's why it's so important to continue creating opportunities so that um, girls can dream to be the best in the world. And I, I think that money is obviously a huge issue. And um, I think that that's why it's so important to support nonprofits and organizations like I Play Like a Girl that are trying to create um, more opportunities and resources for um, young girls and boys that don't have access to it. And I know that I feel super lucky to have sports in my life and, and that's something that's, that's really important. And yeah, I think that um, I can't speak enough about how powerful of an impact sport has been on my life, which is why I would encourage everyone to try to support um, youth and grassroots involvement in sport and amazing organizations like I Play Like a Girl. First of all, let me uh, thank uh, the Dartmouth girl for her contribution to our alma mater. <laughs> uh, how would you all like to see the transgender issue resolved? I don't know, I don't know if resolved is, a, is an interesting word. I, I think it's, you know, what we certainly from a, league, from a WBA standpoint, we are very supportive of in inclusiveness and, and, you know, I think we don't, We've, we've been supportive. I think our, our league by its very existence has been an activist league for a really long time. Um, you know, I think the, um, the issue is certainly fraught and, and it's, you know, it, it brings a lot of um, kind of very serious kind of implications to the sports uh, landscape. And, you know, I don't think that you can, um, 
but there everybody has some very very personal beliefs on you know what the direction should be but I think it's great that we're having conversation about it and I think that it's it's forcing people to really evaluate you know their own personal stances on things that are really complex um, so you know certainly we have been supportive of um, transgender rights as a, as a league. Um, and I think that we're um, seeing a, an evolution of the conversation that, that needs to be had. It's, 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 I don't think there's a right or wrong answer. I think it's, it's very intricate. And you know, I don't know that it, I don't know what resolution looks like because it is so complex. We have time for one more question. Well, let's, let's go over here. Hi. I was wondering what your favorite part of playing sports is. Like, what do you like most about it? Ooh, that's a good question. Who wants to start? Um, I'll start. My favorite part about playing sports is definitely the friendships I've made. And I think that the most special friendships um, all came from teammates when, um, during times when I was struggling the most. So when you're really sad, or you're working really hard, and it's not working out. Um, and you have teammates that are right there going through that with you and you're able to share that with them and work together. I think um, that just forms really special friendships and that's been the best part for me. Definitely, the, the, the teammates, the connections with other women and girls who, when I was playing, that was the best part. When I <clears throat> think about miss what I miss the most, it's definitely the locker room, it's definitely <laughs> just all the jokes and just all the, you know, there's so much that happens in such an awesome space because you are either, you know, preparing to go to war together or you're, <laughs> you know, kind of supporting each other when you've been defeated and you're recovering or you're just, you know, and it just brings together all these different kinds of people from all different walks of life with a shared mission, it's really cool. Yeah. Same, just I think that community, I think, it, the sports community is very special. Um, so I love that part about, about athletics, right? Like the community, um, being on the field, being on the court, being competitive, going through the highs and lows on, on the field, but then also off the field. You know, they're for a short amount of time, you know, they're the people that you see every single day and people that you go through a lot of things with, um, the highs and the lows. and get a lot of laughs and good times with it along the way. Yeah. Do you want to ask another? Oh, are you sure? You look like you have a question. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thank you. One more question? Well, my question is, what are some mental and physical habits that young athletes should adopt to succeed? Um, I, my first thing, I think, when I think about habits, I think create a routine um, that is successful for you and then you can use it to adjust, you can constantly adjust your routine. So as you prepare for, a, uh, as you prepare for practice, are you preparing the same way as you are preparing for a game? And then you can take little snip, snippets of that routine, like your breathing exercises, your positive, um, words, your mindset stuff, you can take those things into how you prepare for a test or a speech at school or um, a conversation with your parents, whatever it is. So you can take little things like that, but I really do believe in having a good routine and being very consistent in it so that it helps you maximize your potential on game day. <clears throat> I think and not a whole lot more to add than that. I think the discipline around kind of how you prepare and the bigger level of preparation being of the utmost importance to you. And then I, I really believe in visualization. So mm -hmm. just like taking the time to really see yourself in the moment where you need to perform or even just visualizing yourself being at your peak um, health wise. So as, and letting that guide the decisions that you make about food and diet and all that, that, that fuel your performance. So. I agree, routine, discipline, and visualization. I think um, mine would be to try to look at really challenging, hard situations in both sport and not sport as opportunities to grow. Because I think that in order to become a better athlete, you're going to have to challenge yourself and 
you're going to have to play with the older girls or play against the better team. And if you can look at that as a really exciting opportunity to grow and to challenge yourself rather than be nervous for that, then I think that will push you. And I also think that you need to push yourself in order to see what your limits are. And I think that we're all a lot more capable than we think we are. So it's important to embrace challenges as, as really exciting opportunities to grow. That was a great question to close it off. Let's give another round of applause for our incredible panel, Monica Abbott, Bethany Donovan, and Trisha Mangan. And thank you to the National Archives and Play Like a Girl for teaming up to host this incredible event. And thank you all for coming out and enjoying this incredible event. So you can meet us all in the lobby for a little bit of uh, networking and a photo opportunity. Thank you for joining us.